Now let's see some more examples of local variable usage, which will actually cause new assembly instructions to appear. So in this thing, array local variable, we've got three variables. We've got short A, we've got an integer array B, which is six integers long, and we've got a long, long C. And so we initialize some of these variables. And you know, as I'm talking to my wife in hex, as I often do, I say, hey, babe, you know, Balboa bled blood. And she's like, true, true. And so we go ahead and allocate these. We take A and we stick it into B of 1. We take B of 1 and we add it to C, put it into B of 4, and we return B of 4 as short. This is the assembly that gets generated. And we've got three new assembly instructions. I'm all which is multiplication, signed multiplication, move sx, which is signed extend, which is move with signed extension, and move zx, which is move with zero extension. All right, the first one, imol, or signed multiply. Now, the first thing to know is that Visual Studio seems to really like signed multiply over unsigned multiply, which is just mul. And so that's kind of just a Visual Studioism when you try to create a multiply, even if you're using all unsigned values, it'll still prefer imul over mul. This is actually a way that you can kind of infer that code was generated with this particular compiler, for instance. Now there are three forms of imul. The first one takes a single operand, the second one takes two operands, and the third one takes three operands. And it's the first one that's actually a little bit complicated because the fact that it has a single operand, it's not just multiplying that register by itself. Instead, there's a variety of forms which implicitly take different sizes of RAX and RDX or EAX and EDX, etc. So there's like this implicit thing where you just kind of have to memorize which registers are used implicitly based on the size. And we'll see a little bit more about that in a second. The two and the three operand ones behave a little more as you would expect. So for instance, this one takes the register, multiplies it by this, and stores it back into there. This one takes this register memory location, stores, uh, multiplies it by the immediate, and stores it back into this. So it's the typical sort of you know, source and destination and source from this operand. But that said, the fact that this can actually take three operands is seemingly unique amongst what we might consider the basic assembly instruction set, not the sort of add-on set like MMX, AVX, et cetera, but amongst very simple basic assembly instructions, uh, this is the only one that I know of that actually takes three operands. Now, in previous versions of the class, I kind of left it at that, and then I moved on to some examples. Now in previous versions of the class, I would just sort of leave it at that, those three example forms that I showed on the previous slide. But because I want to sort of test you rigorously later on using our dark math magic games, I'm gonna go ahead and show you all the possible forms just so that you can have them on the slides without having had to go all the way into the manual because we don't learn about uh, looking things up in the manual until quite late in the class. So I'll show you all the different forms which you know could be grouped into five groups or three groups. It kind of just depends on how you decide to break it up. I'm gonna put it into five groups just so that I have more space on slides. Now this first group are the versions that have a single operand. And these are the ones where I said they have implicit usage of EAX, AL, RAX, etc. So what you'll actually see is IMUL and then an RM8. So that's gonna be an eight bit register or a eight bit uh, a value calculated from memory that'll only be plucking eight bits out of that memory location. Now implicitly, if you ever see a 8-bit sized IMOL or you know 8-bit register being used in the IMOL, what's happening is it will implicitly use AL, the least significant byte of the RAX register, and multiply it by that 8-bit register or 8-bit value that came out of memory, and then it'll store it back into the AX register. So AX is 16 bits, this is eight, so eight times eight going into a 16-bit register. There's no sort of uh, danger of truncation or anything like that because you've got something that's twice the size of the two things being multiplied. And then the same basic structure continues for the rest of the assembly instructions. If it's a 16-bit value, you take the 16-bit, least significant 16 bits of the RAX register AX times the 16-bit value, and you store it into this 32-bit value, the concatenation of DX for the most significant 16 bits and AX for the least significant 16 bits. 32-bit form takes 32-bit register times 32-bit value, stores it into a 64-bit 
output, which is the concatenation of EDX for the most significant bytes and EAX for the least significant. And again, same thing, 64-bit times 64-bit into 128-bit output. Then there are the two operand values, but here the form is 16-bit value times 16-bit value stored back into 16-bit value. And so that obviously can potentially lead to truncation because you can just multiply two values and they're going to be you know, greater than the maximum space available in 16 bits. And then that's going to be stored, but in a truncated form back into this output. So 16 times 16 into 16, 32 times 32 into 32, 64 times 64 into 64. So these can cause truncation. So now group three is going to have three operands and there's gonna be a version with eight bits, a version with 16 bits, and a version with 32 bits. But we are only gonna put the eight bit form on this first slide. So in the eight bit form, you take this 16 bit value you have an 8-bit immediate value, and that's going to be sign extended up to 16 bits. So then you're going to basically be multiplying this, treat it as if it was a sign value times the 16-bit value, and stored into a 16-bit value. So that means that you can have truncation, just like in the two operand form. Same thing with uh, 32 and 64 bits. You just take an 8-bit value and sign extend it up to a 32-bit value, multiply it by that, and store it into that. Sign extended up to a 64-bit value, multiply it by that, and store it into that. So this, again, can obviously cause truncation, right? So if this value in 64-bit register was, you know, 1 minus the maximum value and you multiplied by 2, then it's obviously going to, you know, be larger than the possible 64-bit value. Now this is, again, three operands, but it's just going to be a 16-bit, and there's actually only one variation on this. There's only one thing that takes a 16-bit immediate value, and that'll be a 16-bit register or memory times the 16-bit value stored into a 16-bit register. Finally, the last three operand form is a 32-bit immediate. There is nothing that takes a 64-bit immediate. So this is, again, you know, later on when you learn to read the fund manual, you can go and verify this for yourself by checking it out. But the forms are take a 32-bit value, multiply by 32 bits, store in a 32-bit so that can truncate, and take a 32-bit value, not a 64-bit, sign extended up to 64 bits, multiply by the 64-bit register, and then store it into the different 64-bit register. So this could be a register or memory, rather, but this can only be a register. So those are all the possible forms that you could see for the multiply later on, so feel free to come back to this slide when you do the dark mathematic game later on. Now let's see some quick examples from each of those groups. So, for instance, let's start with the single operand form. So again, IMOL with a RM8. Implicitly, it's always going to take the RM8 times AL and store it into AX. So if these were our registers starting out, so RAX happens to be fully filled in, R12, it's 000084. If you saw the assembly instruction IMOL R12B, that would mean you're using the byte size, the least significant byte of R12. And so when you have an IML with a RM8, implicitly you're using this form. And that means you're going to need to take AL, the least significant byte, 77, times R12B, the least significant byte, which is 84. But this is now, again, a signed multiply. And if this is signed multiply, then this value, 84, is a negative number. So we've actually got a negative value times a positive value. So negative times positive is going to be a negative value. And that will be stored into AX. So the end result here is that all the rest of this register is actually going to be left alone. And just the AX, least significant 16 bits, are going to be updated with this value. Now let me pop out into the calculator quick to show you how you could calculate this for yourself. So... We said 77 is a positive value, but 84 is a negative value. So let's go ahead and take 84, and let's twos complement that to get the negative value, or sorry, to flip the sign, because it is a negative value, so let's get the positive value. So 84 as a one-byte value is actually 7C as a positive value. So negative 7C is 84 in one-byte twos complement form. So 7C is one of the values, and 77 is the other, so if I did 7c, which is now the positive form of this negative value, times 77, that would be giving me a value that's, you know, a positive value, but I said negative times positive should be a negative value at the end, so I need to twos complement this again to flip it back to negative, 
and that's going to be, you know, AX is just going to be 16 bits, and so we just care about the C65C, and that's what we get here. Now later on in the class, we're going to learn about how to write inline assembly, but just again, because I wanted to kind of show this to you, because this is one of the elements that people had the most trouble with on some of the games. Let's go ahead and look at that in inline assembly. So inside of your project, there is Scratchpad ASM, and there's the My ASM project. And so I just did a move of this value into RAX, move of 84 into R12, and then an IMOL by R12B. So if I go ahead and run that through the debugger, I can go ahead and bring up the registers window to show you on the top here. RAX has the value that I moved in from right here. R12 has the value 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 084 that I moved in right here. And now I'm going to issue the IMOL R12B and if I just go ahead and step, then I can see that these least significant 16 bits of RAX just changed. All the rest is all the same, right? So 60, 99, 66, all that's all the same, but just these bits right here changed. And that's kind of why this is highlighted in red. It's telling you this register changed and other stuff didn't except, you know, RIP because you stepped forward and, you know, nothing else changed there, flags changed. So that's just to show you that what I said in the calculator lines up with what actually happens in the assembly. So let's go ahead and stop that and I'll move on to what's going to be my next example here and back to the slides. Okay, so that was an example of a single operand form of IMOL. Again, signed multiply, so you have to take into account whether or not the things that are being multiplied are negative values like this or positive values. Okay, next example. This is a two operand form, and so if we see IMOL with an R32 and an RM32, then the actual mathematical operation is a signed version of that R32 times the RM32 stored back into the R32. So again, truncation is possible. So now in this case, if we have IMOL doing R12D, so the D word sized, the 32-bit sized version of R12, well, this is no longer interpreted as a negative value because it's not a one byte form, it's a four byte form, and the four byte form has zero, 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 so this is just going to be positive 84. Then RAX taking the EAX size, the 32 bit value size, this is going to be A9, blah, 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 but that is going to be a negative value in 32 bit form. Something starting with A has the most significant bit set, you know, it's greater than seven, so it's going to be a negative value. So this is going to be a positive times a negative value. So again, a positive value times a negative value is going to lead to a negative value. So what's going to come out of this is 00061D0415C in R12 because it's storing, it's taking this times that, storing it back into that. So let's go ahead and look at that in the calculator to confirm this. So I'm going to take this value right here. This is my negative value. To go ahead and put that in, I'm going to twos complement it to get back to the positive value. I'm going to multiply that times 84, which is a positive value. All right, that gives me something. But we said positive times negative. Well, I just flipped to the sign of the negative to a positive, so I need to flip the result back to get back to the negative. And then that leaves me with this value. Now, this value is bigger than the 32-bit register, which it's going to be stored back into. So we need to, you know, just in our calculator, the hardware will obviously do this itself. We need to end it with 32 ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Fs equals 32 ones. And that gives us 61D0415C, 61D0415C. And again, we can reconfirm that in the debugger as well if we'd like. Same values in the registers, just a different multiply, signed multiply R12 D word size times EAX. Right, here's the values, go ahead and step over, and the result is stored back into R12, and so we have 61D0415C. So let's go ahead and move on to the last example. All right, now we have a three operand form. So we're going to do a 64-bit, we're going to take 64-bit times 32-bit, which is going to be sign extended up to 64 bits, and then it's going to be multiplied by that and stored into this. 
So what would that be in this case? Well, we've got 84, which actually isn't even going to play into anything. R12 is just going to be the output register, but you can see it's not actually used in the multiply. So it's just going to be RAX times this immediate value, and that's going to yield this. And so that is just a straight up multiply, this value times that value, which you can sign extend it, but it's just a positive value. So it's still just going to be one, two, three, four. And so we put it in and that's the output. So let's go ahead and calculate that. This times one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and we get E5, blah, 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 blah. And over in the debugger, same thing. Oops, we're not gonna because I changed that to negative. So as I was fiddling with MASM, I was noticing that I really didn't like it when I chose you know, negative constants. And like if I put that in there, it'll just straight up not compile. So let's go ahead and do that just to show you. It really doesn't like negative values for these immediates for some reason. And the reason seems to be that like syntactically, it wants you to put negative values in front of it instead of just using the you know, two's complement form of it. But anyways, you know, so you could put a negative on there and you know, it would be negative one, two, three, four, and then it would be sign extended up to that. But just to complete our example here, let's see that we see the same thing. All right, oops. Let's go ahead and step over and let's not continue. So step over and what is the value in R12? E5, A35, blah, 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 2A, 2C. E5, A35, blah, 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 2A, 2C. So for the heck of it, let's just go ahead and make that a negative value. Go ahead and stop, negative. And so you can see that, you know, it's just a negative 32-bit value right there. When we go ahead and run that, if we look at the disassembly, we should see the actual value. This is the negative one, two, three, four, negative one, two, three, four. You can see that it put that in there for us. Let's go ahead and look at the bytes just to prove that that's a 32-bit value that's in the code stream, not a 64-bit value. So if I look at the raw assembly bytes here, I can actually see that this value, this negative value, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, these eight bytes right here, EDCB, EDCC, these are actually built into this stream, EDCB, EDCC. So the assembly instruction actually only has the capability to bake in a 32-bit value here. It doesn't have a form that supports a 64-bit value in the assembly stream. But again, we haven't really covered uh, you know, how these assembly bytes stuff, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull the wool over your eyes again. So anyways, if we did that and we stepped over it, we would just get some different value, right? Different multiplication, different value, but the key thing is that you saw it was, you know, sign extended up to a 64-bit value. All right, so that's my much longer treatment of the signed multiply assembly instruction. Hopefully should be a lot more useful to you later on when you're called upon to do the various versions of multiply in the Dark Math Magic game. Now, the other two assembly instructions that we saw in this example code were move with zero extend and move with sign extend. Now, these are typically used to move small C types into large C types. So if you're you know, moving a signed value from a short, like we have in the example code, into a integer, which is 32-bit value, so 16-bit value to a 32-bit value, if the short is signed, then the value needs to be reflected as a signed value in the 32-bit value. And that means you're going to want to move with sign extent. On the other hand, if it was an unsigned short being moved into a 32-bit value, then you would move with zero extend, basically saying, you know, don't try to treat this as a signed thing. So these moves support all the same sort of register to register, register to memory, memory to register, immediate to memory, immediate to register forms that you see in a normal move. But like I just said, there's this different notion of zero extension and sign extension. And at its most basic form, zero extension means that when the CPU, when it's taking some small register and moving it to a big register, will just fill in the upper bits with all zeros. So 16-bit register to a 32-bit register, then it's going to automatically fill in all zeros in the upper 16 bits. On the other hand, sign extension is a thing where the compiler has to generate the right assembly instruction so that things are treated as if they're signed. You know, if the high level language wanted them signed, the low level assembly language needs to treat them as if they're signed. And what that means is 
If you had a 16-bit register and you were moving it to a 32-bit register, if the value in that register in the high-level programming language was treated as a signed value, it needs to keep its sign, which means if it was positive, it should stay positive, and if it was negative, it should stay negative. So you can imagine, okay, I've got a 16-bit value, F, 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 right? What is that? That's negative one. So if I take the 16-bit value, F, 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 negative one, and I move it to a 32-bit register, that better not just turn into a positive 16,000 all of a sudden. It should stay negative one. And to stay negative one, the compiler, the assembly instructions have to say, okay, what's the most significant value of F, 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 F? What's the most significant bit? It's one. And so it sign extends that one into the upper bits of the larger 32-bit value, which means you get F, 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 you know, you get eight Fs rather than four Fs so that still it's treated as a negative one in subsequent assembly instructions. And then one extra little bit that I'm again adding in based on you know, student feedback is that there is technically a, another form of the sign extension move SXD. And so this has to do with sign extending D word values up to 64 bit values. So 32 bit values up to 64 bit values. Technically the move sign extension only deals with taking eight and 16 bit values and making them longer. Whereas if you wanna start with a 32 bit value, it is this. I'm not actually gonna give it its own star, both for the fact that I don't wanna renumber everything and also just because it's a simple variant on one of the existing assembly instructions we've seen. But it matters because you know if you're looking at the assembly and you see, hey, you never told me about move SXD. Well, it's just move assign extend, but you happen to have a 32 bit value rather than eight or 16. And what's weird here is that there is no move zero extend D word. It's always just move zero extend. So there's some asymmetry here that the signed has a variant and the zero extension doesn't. So let's see a quick example of move with zero extend versus move with sign extend, just to make it a little more concrete. Let's say I had the value food face and I moved it into the 32 bit register EAX. Then if I move with zero extend EAX, 32-bit value, into RBX, 64-bit value, zero extend means just take the upper 32 bits and treat it as zero. On the other hand, this value EAX still has food face. If I run move sign extension D word, because the EAX is 32-bit value food face, move with sign extension means look at the most significant bit of this 32-bit value. If it's one, put all the ones up here so that it's still treated as a negative value. Because if it's one here, it means it must've been a negative value and you want it to stay negative. So fill in all ones up here so that the larger value is treated as negative as well. If I had something where it was, you know, move ood face, if this was a zero, even though I was using a sign extension, if this is zero, then it would just fill in zeros up here because the most significant bit would be zero and it would just fill it in. All right, well, those are how the IMOL and move with sign extension and move with zero extension assembly instructions work. Now what I need you to do is go ahead and step through the assembly as before. At, you know, show where the local variables are and you know, try to get a sense of what's initialized and what's uninitialized.